This conference will now be recorded. To share my work, even though I can't be there in Alaska in person right now. Um, I just wanted to say up front that this being a talk about wolf diet, there's going to be a few photos included of kill sites and carcasses that are a little bit gory. So I will try to warn you ahead of time when one of those is coming up, just in case you're the sort of person who doesn't really want to see that. So before I jump into the coastal wolf story that I'm gonna to tell today, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself with you all. As you can see here, I've always been a big fan of wolves and the natural world. I grew up in Minnesota, but I ended up moving to Atlanta, Georgia, where I completed my bachelor's in environmental science and biology at Emory University. As an undergrad, I was working primarily on research projects with smaller organisms like bumblebees and salamanders, and I always said I would never sell out and start studying big things, but now here we are. Uh, after graduating, I was awarded a Fulbright Research Fellowship to study Arctic fox conservation in Norway, and then after a year of living there, I found out that I'd been selected for a National Science Foundation yeah. Graduate Research Fellowship, so I ended up taking that to Oregon State University, where I am now and i started my phd in wildlife sciences with dr tall levy there now my phd research is split between two very different ecosystems some of my projects are in the myobiosphere reserve of northern guatemala which is where i am currently i'm actually in the bathroom of my apartment in flores guatemala um, and down here, I'm working primarily on a project to use molecular genetic techniques to reconstruct neotropical food webs by studying the diets of large predators like jaguars, pumas, and ocelots. But I'm also doing some camera trapping work in the canopy. And this year, I started a scarlet macaw conservation genetics project as well. But the other side of my research is based, of course, in Alaska, where I've been focusing primarily on coastal wolf diet and population ecology, while also pursuing some side projects related to brown bears and coastal lynx and red foxes. But as you know, today I'm going to be discussing my coastal wolf work in some of the national parks in southwest Alaska. So our story starts in Katmai National Park and Preserve, which is located in southwest Alaska across from Kodiak Island. You can see it in orange here on this map. Katmai is most commonly known for its iconic fat brown bears, which congregate at Brooks Falls in the park's interior to feed on sockeye salmon running upstream from Bristol Bay each year. However, Katmai is also has nearly 500 miles of rugged coastline that is separated from the rest of the park by the Aleutian Range and only accessible by boat or bush plane. These coastal environments are characterized by these deep fjords, which end in large open, open sedge meadows and host some of the highest brown bear density in the world, especially in the early summer months. The Katmai Coast is also home to an enigmatic population of coastal wolves, which are the stars of our show today. This photo represents the impetus for this project. In 2016, the park's coastal biologist, Kelsey Griffin, observed this wolf carrying a sea otter carcass down the beach. And she wasn't the only one who saw this. Wolves were observed at sea otter carcasses across several different sites on the Katmai coast, including on small offshore islands and rock scurries. Now I'm gonna digress for just a moment here to provide some important context for these sightings of wolves with sea otters, um, which is that sea otters have recently reoccupied the Katmai coast after being nearly extirpated from the Gulf of Alaska. Otters were hunted to local extinction throughout most of their Northern Pacific range by the maritime fur trade in the, in the 1800s. This figure here is from a book chapter written by James Bodkin on the history and contemporary status of sea otters in the North Pacific. And it shows the historic range of sea otters pre fur trade that's in the yellow here, which is overlaid by their current range in purple. So as you can see, there are many areas of the coast which still today otters have yet to recover into. The bulk of the fur trade harvest of these sea otters was in the very beginning of the 1800s, but as their population rapidly declined, some countries, I think particularly Russia, started implementing male only harvest restrictions which led to a short-lived population recovery. You can see as it starts to go up again on the right side of the graph here um, throughout the second half of the 19th century. But then by the beginning of the 1900s, the population had crashed again and the sea otter fur trade was officially ended. 
In an attempt to stimulate sea otter population recovery in the Northern Pacific, some individuals from a remnant population in the Aleutians were translocated in the 1960s to Southeast Alaska by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in collaboration with other organizations. I think this is a really cool photo here of them unloading an otter in a crate from uh, what seems to be maybe a boat or a plane. And this translocation effort was ultimately successful and explains the large numbers of sea otters that can now be found in the region of the Gulf of Alaska today, in that region of the Gulf of Alaska today, specifically um, in the waters outside of Glacier Bay National Park, which is outlined in orange on the map here. Now, here's my first warning. There's some otter gore on the next slide. So close your eyes if you don't want to see it. <laughs> so there is some precedent for wolf consumption of marine resources. There is some super cool wolf research happening in the Alexander Archipelago of Southeast Alaska, being led by one of my scientific idols, Gretchen Roffler, with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in collaboration with our lab at OSU. They recently published a paper in PNAS, which is up at the top of the screen here, which describes extensive marine resource consumption by island wolves, even when their traditional prey options like Sitka black-tailed deer are still available in the area. This figure from an earlier paper about the same study um, shows how certain groups of Alexander Archipelago wolves, for example, this pack that's living on Pleasant Island right near Glacier Bay, are consuming a ton of sea otter, enough to constitute more than half of their diet for this pack. So given this rapid recolonization of sea otters moving northward and across the Gulf of Alaska, and the fact that we are seeing some of these island wolf packs already taking advantage of sea otters as a prey option, we wanted to characterize wolf diet for these mainland coastal wolf populations in southwest Alaska, starting on, on the Katmai coast where we're already seeing wolves with sea otters, and where sea otters are known to be abundant and the only ungulate prey option is a low density moose population. Ungulates meaning hoofed mammals like um, moose and other deer. And ultimately, we're hoping to determine how many marine or how marine resource utilization might shape different aspects of the population ecology of these wolves, such as their numbers, their social dynamics, and their space use. For this presentation, I define marine resources as anything that is uniquely available in a coastal ecosystem. So this includes fishes and marine mammals, but also includes things like intertidal invertebrates and seabirds. The bulk of our sample collection for this investigation was conducted in the summer of 2021 from June through September and into early October. Field logistics, as some of you may know, in coastal Alaska are extremely complex, but we were able to sample six distinct locations on the Katmai coast, which are outlined in uh, the red circles in this map here. And we actually added a seventh site in 2022 as well, which is not on this figure, but it's located in between Swickshack and Hallow Bay in the middle of the coast there. Two of these sites we were only able to visit once, but the other four we visited once towards the beginning of our season and then again at the end of the summer in an attempt to capture any shifts in wolf diet that might occur with the turning of the season. We accessed all of these sites with our small planes, which would land us and our gear on narrow strips of beach. And it was always sort of a clown car situation, fitting all of the equipment that we needed to do our science for several weeks into these tiny planes, but we always made it work. And after being dropped off, we would camp for about two weeks at a time in the back dune meadows at each location, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, and ideally in spots with access to fresh water so that we could have stuff to filter for cooking and drinking. And needless to say, these field sites were some of the most beautiful places that I've ever camped in my life. This photo shows my all-time favorite field camp, which was located at Cape Douglas on the Katmai Coast. All of our research methods for this project were what we would call non-invasive methods, which just means that we do, they did not involve capturing or otherwise harassing any of the wildlife in order to collect our data. Now, there are pros and cons to this style of research, but one of the obvious pros, especially when working in a national park, is that you don't condition the animals to run and hide from people if you aren't trapping and darting them. One super common non-invasive method for studying wildlife is camera trapping, which most of you are probably already familiar with. This involves using automatic digital camera installations to monitor wildlife activity. Here are some of the setups that I deployed for this project on the Katmai coast, and about half of them got demolished by brown bears. So 
uh, we had, you know, some really good cameras and some that we didn't get any data from. Now, I've been criticized before for filling up my talks with too many camera trap videos, but I'm not ready to change my ways yet because really who doesn't love watching videos of beautiful Alaskan wildlife? A lot of the camera trapping work ends up being useful just for having these amazing videos, um, like this one here of the animals we are studying to share with people and to sort of get people excited about the research. But the videos are also useful for a variety of other things. For example, they can provide us with insights into the demographic composition of specific wolf packs. When we get a high quality video of certain a certain individual, we can often take note of their coat patterning and coloration and then recapture or reobserve the same individual on cameras at different sites. And if you're lucky enough to capture them peeing on camera, like the one in this video, you can actually tell their sex as well. For example, using this video, we now know that this wolf is a female, and if we see her on other cameras, we'll know it's a her. Camera trap videos are also useful for providing us with minimum counts of the number of individual wolves in a pack. For example, we see five adult wolves together in this video, which lets us know that we should expect to see at least five unique individuals in our samples from this specific field site when we analyze the DNA in them later. This counting technique also applies to puppies, of course. If we are lucky enough to get them on camera after they are born and come out of their den in the early summer, the wolves are also often curious about the cameras. We did have some destroyed by wolves as well as by bears. <laughs> And if we get the same litter of puppies on video multiple times throughout the summer, we can watch them grow and become more independent. And then we can venture a guess as to how many of them are surviving into adolescence. This can be difficult, though, because we can't always capture all of the puppies together on the video. These pups were from the same pack as the ones in the video I showed before. And last but not least, we can use these camera trap videos to document some of the prey that the wolves are eating. Before we even start with the genetic methods, we can know some things about their foraging ecology from these. For example, in this video, we had confirmation that the cat my coastal wolves were eating salmon before we even detected salmon in their diet using the genetic methods. Here's another good example. The video happens really fast, um, but we can see that the wolf here is carrying the carcass of an Arctic ground squirrel in her mouth as she runs by. I definitely had to watch that one a couple of times before I knew what it was. <laughs> Another non-invasive method that we use to acquire samples is that we can, um, we can use hair snaring to get hair samples for our genetic analysis later on. This involves wrapping barbed wire around a fallen log or a tree stump and then baiting the log itself with a scent lure like gusto or mega musk. They're lures used by both wildlife ecologists and hunters. And they're basically super stinky and prompt this scratch and rub response from curious wolves. When they rub up against the barbed wire, they leave tufts of their fur behind for us to collect. And sometimes they try to eat the log as well. <laughs> Here's another video of a wolf showing that scratch and rub response that we look for. This method is super useful when paired with effective camera trapping because it allows us to associate a visual identity for an individual wolf with their genetic identity from the hair sample that they leave behind. So this sort of bridges our camera trap data for individual pack members with the genetic data that we end up having for them. The main problem that we have with the hair snaring is that the bears are often um, more often than not the first ones on the scene and they can be very destructive of the hair snare setups and leave their hair behind as well which not only contaminates the sampling area with bear dna but can also be surprisingly difficult to differentiate from wolf pair when in the field especially for someone like me who doesn't have a ton of experience yet And last but certainly not least is fecal sampling or scat collection, which is really the foundation of this project. The bulk of our time in the field was spent hiking around and collecting scat samples across as large of an area as possible. At times, this involved crazy bushwhacking, lots of bear encounters, pack rafting, and fording sketchy big river mouse like the one in this picture here. 
it's really important to always work in teams of two because of all the potential dangers we encounter while trying to cover as much ground as possible as we can on our endless quest to find more wolf poop. We're always looking for the main use areas for these wolf packs, which are their dens and rendezvous sites, because these are a gold mine of genetic materials like scat and hair. They can also help us make assumptions about what individual wolves are included together in a pack, because when we detect their scats together on one of these sites, we can pretty safely assume that they are members of the same social group. We never go on to these sites when the wolves are using them. So the dens in these photos that we found had already been moved off of, um, the, the wolves had already moved off of them by the time that we got to them and moved on to their rendezvous sites. Um, and these rendezvous sites are usually nearby the den and are big open areas where the pups can have a little bit more independence when playing and still be supervised by the older members of the pack. Several of the rendezvous sites that we found on the Katmai coast were basically right on the beach, which was pretty cool to see. Once we have all of our scat and hair samples, I bring them back to our laboratory at OSU and I extract the DNA from them and then prepare it to be sequenced by a big expensive machine called an Illumina sequencer, which can read and distinguish individual DNA molecules to provide us with the data that we need to con conduct different genetic analyses. One thing that we do with this genetic data is use it to distinguish and count individual wolves using single nucleotide polymorphisms which are basically single base pair differences in the DNA sequences of different individuals. These SNPs for short form the genotype for an individual wolf, which you can kind of think of as a wolf's unique genetic fingerprint. I also analyze all of the scats using a method called fecal DNA metabarcoding, which allows us to identify individual prey items by detecting their DNA that is left behind in the scat after they have been eaten and digested by a wolf. The wolf's own DNA is present in the scat as well, which allows us to confirm that the scat did indeed come from a wolf and not, for example, a coyote or a lynx. These metabarcoding data are going to be the main results that I share with you all today in this talk, although I will also discuss the genotyping a little bit towards the end. We were able to cover a lot of ground um, during our time at Katmai and all, uh, at all of our sites as well. As you can see in this figure here, all the little red dots are wolf scats that we collected on the Katmai coast. Um, we also collected scats from foxes, mustelids, and bears as well as wolf. Wolves, we have processed nearly 800 of these scats for metabarcoding so far, and 545 of them contained both wolf DNA and vertebrate prey DNA. So these are, and passed all of our quality control criteria. So these are the ones that are included in the figures I'm going to show. Now we're going to look at the results for our Katmai Coastal Wolf Diet Study now. We detected an average of 1.67 unique prey items per one wolf scat, which means that most of the time wolves eat more than one meal per bowel movement. Overall, we detected 67 unique species in all of these wolf scats combined, which is a pretty astounding dietary diversity. In this figure, the Y axis on the left here is going to show you the names of the different prey species that we detected in wolf diet, while the X axis at the bottom is going to represent the number of scats that each prey item was detected within. So you can sort of think of this number at the bottom here as the number of wolf meals that included a specific prey species. The red bars are going to represent prey items that come from the terrestrial system, while the blue bars are marine prey items. First of all, we see that wolves are still eating some moose, even when they're not super abundant, and that they're also taking advantage of some of the typical terrestrial alternate prey options like beaver and arctic ground squirrels. We know from research in Minnesota and other systems as well that beaver are a pretty popular alternative prey option for wolves, so this wasn't super surprising. We also see brown bear showing up in their diet, which is pretty neat. This observation was corroborated by some anecdotes that park visitors shared with us while we were working out on the coast um, of wolf packs hunting down brown bear cubs and spring cubs in particular. I'll share a couple of those with you. One was a photography group told us that there had been a bear, a grizzly sow or a brown bear sow with her cubs foraging out on the mud flats. And then the tide came in and the mom went into the beach and the babies were left on what had become an island of sand out in the bay. And they started yelling for mom and 
Fortunately for the wolf, unfortunately for the cubs, the wolves heard them yelling and were able to make it out to the island and actually kill and eat one of the cubs before mom could get out to intervene. In another instance, we were told that some wolves had treed a bear cub and basically waited it out at the bottom of the tree and that the wolves were seen later that day carrying the carcass of the cub down the beach. So hunting the brown bear cubs, even though we typically think of brown bears as being bigger than wolves, when they're really little, they are a prey option for wolves, especially in this system. Now it starts to get really exciting because we see that these wolves are eating a ton of salmon. In fact, a fourth of the wolf scats that we analyzed successfully contained salmon DNA. We know from previous studies in British Columbia and Southeast Alaska that wolves and many other terrestrial carnivores eat a lot of salmon when they run upstream in the, in the summertime. And like I discussed earlier, we captured wolves with salmon several times on our camera traps. And these photos that are included here on this slide were taken by park visitors actually of the Katmai coastal wolves catching salmon rather than just scavenging the carcasses, which they likely do as well because there are a lot of carcasses towards the end of the season. I've separated salmon into its own bin here because it's a seasonally discrete resource, but it's important to note here that if you group all fish into one category, it would comprise the most common summer diet item for these coastal wolves. Um, we also detected a variety of oceanic fish species in wolf diet. And this is really interesting because the range of species represented here is huge and suggests that wolves are getting oceanic fish in a lot of different ways. Some of the smaller species like the stickleback here or the sculpin um, might be consumed either as marine mammal stomach contents or caught directly in tide pools in the rocky intertidal zone. Whereas species like starry flounder and crescent gunnel, the wolves are most likely fishing for. In fact, this has been seen in Southeast Alaska before as well as in Southwest Alaska. Um, wolves sort of doing the same dash and grab strategy that brown bears employ to catch wolf, or to catch um, fishes in shallow water. Uh, the halibut we were seeing in the diet was most likely consumed when they wash up dead on the beach because it's hard to imagine a wolf killing a halibut in any scenario. <laughs> we detected a variety of seabirds in wolf diets as well. Um, as with the fishes, this is most likely a combination of scavenging and hunting. And this is most, uh, or rather the most commonly detected bird that we saw in wolf diet was actually cormorants, which was interesting because we did find some cormorant nesting colonies at some of our field sites. And one of them, which was on a big cliff on the beach, had wolf tracks pacing back and forth at the bottom of the cliff. So this to us suggested that the wolves were maybe waiting at the bottom, either for like eggs or chicks to fall down or for the carcasses of dead adults to fall down and wanted to be on the scene to eat those as soon as possible when they arrived. Um, another warning, there's a carcass on the next slide. <laughs> so we did detect wolves eating both seals and sea lions on the Katmai coast. Now this was substantiated by an observation by the Parks Coastal Biologist Kelsey Griffin of a lone wolf actually killing a harbor seal after struggling with it for 20 minutes. It was just a one versus one wolf versus adult harbor seal sort of battle that the wolf ended up winning. And there is a photo from that on here in the upper right. This photo in the upper left is a wolf with a sea lion carcass that was seen on the Katmai coast as well. Now it's possible that wolves are killing sea lions as well as scavenging them, but we know for sure that sea lions do wash up dead because during our time there, we saw a lot of sea lion carcasses on the beach and it's sort of more difficult to imagine a wolf successfully killing an adult sea lion just because of their size and ferocity. But again, not impossible, especially not for a group of wolves. We detected three different species of whale in coastal wolf diet in Katmai, which was really interesting, especially because the species detections matched up with carcasses that we saw at different field sites. So at one field site, for example, we saw a humpback whale carcass, and then subsequently we detected humpback whale DNA in wolf scats from that field site. This picture here is that carcass, and there were a ton of brown bear boars always on it, feeding and fighting on top of it very majestically, as you can see here. And we sort of did stakeouts in the early morning of this carcass, hoping to see a wolf feed on it. 
and we got lucky and we got to watch oh sorry that there's sound here hopefully it's not too loud wait i think i just turned it off yeah we luckily got to see this wolf feeding on the carcass at the same time as 13 adult male brown bears so very brave wolf uh, it's poor quality video because it was taken through a spotting scope but you can see that they were tolerating one another perhaps because there was such an abundance of meat it's not really worth fighting over we also detected a variety of other prey items in wolf diet including red foxes porcupines birds rodents snowshoe hare river otter and some weasels we know that marine invertebrates are also a part of wolf diet because we see them in the wolf scats. We will have to use a different, slightly different technique in order to target the marine invertebrate DNA because the method that we use currently is just for vertebrate prey items. But eventually we're hoping to be able to show what species exactly of marine invertebrates the wolves are eating. Um, you can see in these pictures here that based on the remains that we're seeing in the scats, we can make some assumptions about what they're eating. The one on the furthest left here was actually comprised of the uh, exoskeletal tubes of these feather duster worms that you might see in tide pools or on docks, which was really interesting to see uh, that the wolves are eating those. We found several scats at several, several different sites that contained these. We were also finding scats with a lot of beach fleas and clam shells and blue mussel shells in them as well, and crab parts. So lots of different seafood options. And last, but definitely not least, we see this incredible amount of sea otter in wolf diet. About one third of the Katmai coastal wolf scats that we analyzed contained sea otter DNA. So that's a lot of sea otter. And it begs the question, how are the wolves getting the sea otters? Now, there's definitely a lot of scavenging happening, especially because sea otters are thought to be at carrying capacity, meaning their maximum sustainable population numbers off of the Katmai coast. Um, they're washing up dead on the beach pretty often. We did find some carcasses and when a population is at carrying capacity, individuals are dying pretty consistently due to things like malnutrition and disease, if not old age. So in order to try and address the killing side of the equation, we found haul out sites. Um, specifically in this photo, we were staking out a rock scurry at Swick Shack Bay that was just offshore and accessible by a little sand spit when, it, when the tide was low. And we would stake it out every morning for several days in a row with a spotting scope in order to hopefully observe wolves hunting a sea otter or some other marine mammal that had hauled out there. And we got really lucky one morning and we saw three wolves work together to kill a sea otter. One of them came first and seemed to spot the otter and crouched behind a, a, a rock watching it and waited for 15 or 20 minutes. And then two of its pack members came up the beach and each went a different way around to the sides and they did a sort of pincer maneuver to cut off the escape route of this otter back into the water and then they pulled it apart together and ate it and walked off. And warning, there's some sort of intense sea otter carnage on the next slide because I'm going to show the kill site. So yes, we investigated the kill site immediately afterwards and all that was left behind was the mandible and the liver. And it was interesting that they left the liver behind because this is something that predators usually do eat. So we were wondering whether this might be a learned response to avoid ingesting toxins from something like mercury bioaccumulation or paralytic shellfish poisoning. So we went ahead and had that liver tested for these things and it did not come up with unusually high levels of mercury, but it did come up with some other heavy metal toxicity that we're still looking into where that might have come from. So when we look at the overall contribution of marine and terrestrial prey items to wolf diet, we see that at five out of six of the coastal sites we studied, wolves were getting more than half of their meals from the marine system. So the variability and a proportional contribution of terrestrial and marine prey items across these sites demonstrates that there is a spatial component to this utilization of marine resources probably depends on how accessible they are, which has to do not just with things like offshore 
sea otter density at specific sites, but also the extent of beaches versus rocky intertidal versus cliffs that are comprising the shoreline. Um, we see here that sea otter consumption is happening at all sites, but sea otters are more often eaten, um, more heavily utilized, you'd say, at some of the sites in the middle here. Um, for these sites where otter is less common in wolf diet, it seems likely that wolves are only able to scavenge otters that wash up on the beach there. Whereas for these sites where otter is making up a large proportion of wolf diet, like Swick Shack and Cape Douglas here, they're likely being hunted at haul outs or in shallow water in addition to being scavenged. And this trend matched up with what we saw in the field. Swick Shack and Cape Douglas have very obvious marine mammal haul out sites. They have these sort of rocky island spits that are close to shore where we would see marine mammals haul out. Um, whereas Katmai Bay and Kamishak are mostly sandy beach. So not as easy to access hauled out marine mammals there. We also see that there's this this clear temporal component, which is the salmon. Um, Katmai Bay on the far left here was one of the last sites that we visited in the summer, and we happened to be there during the peak of the run when we were collecting samples. So we see a very clear shift for this site in wolf diet to take advantage of the seasonally discrete resource pulse of salmon. Um, if we had continued sampling throughout the peak of the salmon run across all of our sites, it's probable that we would have seen a higher proportion of salmon in diet at all of them. Now, ultimately, these findings really challenge our assumptions about what wolves eat and what they need in their environment to survive. There are several packs of wolves living on the Katmai coast, and they all seem to be thriving despite the relative absence of their traditional primary prey options in the system. Wolves are not always obligate ungulate predators. They are generalists with extremely flexible diets. They're very opportunistic and they're able to take advantage of this sort of shifting mosaic of resource availability in both space and time. Sea otters in particular may be supporting highly successful wolf, wolf populations in areas where we might not traditionally expect wolves to survive based on our standard assumptions about their diet. Now I'm going to shift to talking about the second phase of this research, which was an expansion of the study to include samples from another coastal wolf population in a neighboring national park. Lake Clark National Park and Preserve is located further north up from Katmai, up the Cook Inlet, and we thought that sampling the coastal wolf population here next would provide an interesting point of comparison for the diet of coastal wolves in Katmai. The two national parks are similar in a lot of aspects, but they also differ in some interesting ways as well. For example, the Lake Clark coast is a lot shorter than Katmai coast. And as you can see in this figure here, it's about one third the length of the coast of Katmai. So the Lake Clark coast, uh, not only is it smaller, but it's also a bit more forested when compared to Katmai. And these differences in habitat composition and just geography, among other factors, lead to there being a different suite of available prey species and competitors between the two parks. Our main point of interest here is that sea otter recolonization is still progressing northward up the Cook Inlet, so sea otters have not quite established themselves off of the Lake Clark coast yet. However, Lake Clark's coastline, despite not having superabundant sea otter population still provides ample access to other marine resources like intertidal invertebrate seabirds and fish including salmon now we don't have any real good data on the moose population at either park but our camera trapping data seem to indicate that moose might be a little bit easier to come by on the lake clark coast versus katmai we can't say for sure whether this is due to the lessened hunting pressure from top carnivores in the system or due to some sort of bottom-up control like plant food availability or the extent of suitable moose habitat in each park, but it's something to keep in mind. And another important difference is that Lake Clark has a decent number of black bears, whereas in Katmai, black bears are completely excluded by the huge brown bear population and also due in part to the relative lack of forested habitat, which they prefer. Um, we know from research elsewhere that wolves definitely like to eat black bear. We also found pretty quickly that there is a healthy population of lynx living on the Lake Clark coast as well, which are more rare in coastal Katmai. We also detected wolverine on the Lake Clark, Clark coast, which is really excited, exciting for me. This is one of my favorite animals. 
And interestingly, Lake Clark has a lot of coyotes living on its coastline, while they are somewhat surprisingly absent from the Katmai coast. So this was an interesting dynamic, but also quite annoying because we had to perform an additional genetic assay to be able to tell the wolf DNA from the coyote DNA in, in our samples because they're so similar. And the final difference between the parks is that Lake Clark has more human presence on its coastline, primarily in the form of these land inholdings used by commercial fishermen. Uh, this potentially creates more opportunities for human wildlife conflict that could affect the wolf population there. Uh, this photo shows a carcass of a wolf that was harvested right on the border of the parkland with one of these private inholdings, um, a wolf carcass on the northern Lake Clark coast. So last summer, summer 2022, we again got dropped off at these remote locations on the Lake Clark coast by small bush planes and camped at a variety of gorgeous and sometimes extremely muddy field sites. And we tried to cover as much of the coastline as possible in search of wolf scats, which was a bit less daunting of a task this time, given that it was one third the size of the Katmai coast. We were again able to find some den and rendezvous sites, although it became clear to us as we explored that um, Clay Clark didn't really seem to have quite the same abundance of wolf packs as we had seen in Katmai. This map shows the locations of all the scats that we collected, and unfortunately, many of them ended up being coyote and wolf or and lynx scats instead of wolf, although that's not entirely unfortunate because now we get to study their diet too. But we ended up with 105 Lake Clark coastal wolf scats. So not quite as many as Katmai, but definitely still a good sample size. And uh, all of this was all of the scats that passed our quality control filtering and contained both wolf and vertebrate prey DNA. The average prey items per scat was actually almost identical between the two parks, which was cool to see. However, we only detected 36 unique prey species in Lake Clark wolf diet compared to the 67 that we saw in Katmai. It's very possible that this big difference is just due to the fact that we had more than five times as many scats collected from the Katmai coast and were also covering a much bigger spatial range and more different packs within our field sites there. So in the absence of this hyperabundance of sea otters, we found that moose were the most common prey item for Lake Clark wolves and were detected in almost half of their scats. Both bear species were also showing up in the Lake Clark wolf diet. And interestingly, we actually detected brown bear slightly more frequently than black bear. The second, third, and fourth most common prey categories were birds and small rodents, which is pretty expected. And now we can see that the top six most common prey categories for Lake Clark coastal wolves were all coming from the terrestrial system, which is already very different than the breakdown that we saw for the Katmai wolves. But we do have some fish showing up in Lake Clark as well. And I was actually surprised that we didn't see more salmon in wolf diet here because the Lake Clark coast has a ton of really healthy salmon runs. Now, this is my opportunity to brag about all the silver salmon that I got to catch and eat during my field work this summer. Uh, definitely a major perk of doing field work in Alaska. But anyway, I suspect that the main reason we didn't detect more salmon in wolf diet here was because we ended our field season before several of the runs had even reached their peak. So if we had been able to continue sampling for another month or two, I suspect that more salmon would have started to show up in wolf diet. Now, really interestingly, we did detect two scats with sea otter at one field sites, Shelter Creek, and also detected harbor seal in some scats there as well. It's most likely that this was a sea otter carcass that washed up by chance on shore there rather than an individual that had hauled out, although we can't know for sure. This was really exciting to see because it shows that wolves are taking advantage of the marine mammals whenever they show up right away, even if it isn't necessarily a predictable part of their environment. And our remaining detections were similar to the sort of filler species that we saw in Katmai. Um, interestingly, we detected some uh, American Martin DNA in Lake Clark wolf scats, which we didn't see in Katmai. Now, this figure shows a comparison of some of the major diet categories for Katmai versus Lake Clark coastal wolves. I like this visualization because you can really see how different the foraging strategies are for wolves between these two parks. The main large bodied prey option that is being taken advantage of in Katmai is sea otters, whereas in Lake Clark it is moose. And we, uh, yeah, the moose being the more typical strategy that we would expect of Alaskan wolves. 
And we also see some prey items that are unique to each park. So Lake Clark has its black bears, while Katmai has Arctic ground squirrels. If you look at just the color composition of these diet figures for each park side by side, it's pretty striking how different the marine resource utilization is for each wolf population. Lake Clark coastal wolves are definitely fishing and eating other marine prey when they come across them, but these Katmai wolves are truly sea wolves in the sense that they have focused their hunting and foraging strategy around taking advantage of the marine system and particularly the seasonal salmon runs and high abundance of sea otters. I hope that someone, perhaps even me, will have the opportunity to conduct this same study again, maybe 20 years in the future. I predict that as sea otter population expansion progresses northwards and otters continue to recolonize the coast of Lake Clark, the wolves there will change their foraging strategy to take advantage of this nutritionally dense, large bodied prey item and will start to rely more on the marine system as well. Now I'll talk briefly about the genotyping data, although I'm still in the process of analyzing and refining it still. We have so far detected at least 32 unique individual wolves living on the Katmai coast. And we suspect that each of our six study sites there represents an entirely different pack of wolves. So at least six wolf packs living there. This is really high wolf density, considering that there aren't any deer or caribou herds, well, other than the moose, aren't any deer or caribou herds available to wolves living there. We don't know the numbers for Lake Clark yet, but like I mentioned earlier, it certainly seems that the wolf population there is much smaller in comparison to Katmai. I would definitely hypothesize that the access to sea otters on the Katmai coast is supporting this super high wolf density and that sea otter recolonization due to our human conservation intervention of the translocation um, to help restore their population has also restored a historic food web linkage between wolves and the marine system that has likely existed across the Gulf of Alaska for hundreds of years before the fur trade knocked down sea otter numbers and eliminated that opportunity for wolves. Now, if sea otter recolonization is subsidizing coastal wolf populations like it seems to be doing in Katmai, this has potential cascading impacts for both the marine and terrestrial ecosystems. Otters are a keystone marine predator that is well known to regulate nearshore communities by putting predation pressure on the marine invertebrate prey species that they consume. So it seems unlikely that wolf predation would limit these huge sea otter populations, but any effects that wolves do have on sea otters could potentially have cascading implications for the marine system. On the terrestrial side of things, we can imagine how increased wolf populations due to utilization of sea otters might have broader impacts for ungulate communities. When wolves are only eating moose, that's one thing, but when wolves can eat both moose and sea otters, their population might be able to grow to a greater abundance than we would see for a wolf population with no marine resource access. And consequently, that's when this phenomenon of apparent competition might take place. So apparent competition between sea otters and ungulate prey in this instance is a potential consequence when a growing wolf population gets so large that they are able to consume moose and other deer species enough to cause a decline in their population. So it's competition between the prey species that is mediated by the predator. Now Gretchen's coastal wolf study in the Alexander Archipelago has actually shown that this phenomenon of apparent competition might be taking place for that wolf pack on Pleasant Island that's eating all the sea otters. As the wolf population there has grown, Gretchen has measured a decline in the Sitka black-tailed deer population, which is now nearly extinct on the island. For the next phase of this project, which is underway currently, I will be focusing in further on the sea otter side of the story. I'm going to attempt to use that same genotyping by SNPs method to identify individual sea otters within wolf scats, which would, if, it, if it's successful, don't know whether it will be yet, it would allow me to count how many individual sea otters are being eaten by an individual wolf or an individual pack of wolves over the course of a summer season, which would allow us to start to get towards quantifying the potential population level interaction between wolves and sea otters and catamite. And of course, the dream is to compare wolf diet across all five Gulf of Alaska national parks. I'm always bothering the biologists there to help me collect any wolf samples that they come across um, while they're doing their other activities on the coast. So. Hopefully this project will continue to expand throughout the course of my PhD and beyond. 
Now, if you want to, any more information about this research, I have a couple of live chats that I did with explore.org that you can find on YouTube. If you just Google Cat My Coastal Wolf live chat, uh, these were recorded during my field seasons in both parks. So it's a little bit more insight into what we were finding in real time while conducting the field work. And I'll go to this during questions, but just wanted to say thank you to all the people who helped with the field work and the lab work, as well as the people who have contributed funding. If you're interested in supporting this research, there's a QR code there you can scan where you can make a donation to the project that will help support the collection and processing of more wolf samples. You can follow me on Twitter for live updates for my research here, as well as in Guatemala or here being Alaska. I'm in Guatemala now, both places though. And feel free to email me for anything. And yeah, now I'll take questions while I show this video of a wolf bear interaction that we observed on the Katmai coast. Okay, that's it. I've got a question. Go ahead, Milo. Can you can you hear Milo talking? Can you hear yes. me? Um, would coprophagy pay, play any role in what you detect in wolf scat? Yes. So. Um, that's a great question. Uh, when we look at the meta barcoding data, it's important to consider that we're just seeing what DNA was in the sample. It's not necessarily what was eaten. So something like coprophagy, but also something like another animal peeing on top of the wolf scat. So I wonder when we see these, this pretty high level of red fox showing up in the wolf scats, I wonder whether that's red foxes over marking wolf scats and that's where the DNA is coming from versus them actually eating it. Um, the coprophagy thing is actually a really interesting aspect of my work on red fox diet because we see a ton of brown bear DNA in red fox scats uh, and if you go back way to these early ecology studies, there are like diagrams showing that red foxes eat bear poop um, as a, especially salmon bear poops as a source of food. And it was enough of a sign back in like the 40s to be included in these food web diagrams that people were drawing. So it's cool that we're seeing that still today in the modern, you know, genetic based studies. But yeah, we'll never know. I mean, you would have to put a camera on a pile of poop to know for sure what was contaminating it. So it's just, we always have to make, make that disclaimer in the papers. Go ahead, Steve. How consistent do you think the, um, the predation on sea otters is across seasons? That's yeah, another really mostly. good. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, most, mostly summer data. I'm curious about whether it's consistent across the winter also. Yeah, so I really wish we could do a winter field season. It's just really hard to get out there because of the weather. Um, but sea otters, that part of the, um, you know, the Katmai coastline doesn't freeze solid. There might be ice flows, but it's not like this coast becomes inaccessible to wolves. and it's hard to imagine. I mean, it doesn't snow a ton on the coast, so it's hard to imagine them needing to leave if they, as long as they could continue to find food. And sea otters reproduce year round. They don't have a discrete breeding season. So if wolves are, uh, for example, eating 
pops most of the time, sea otter pops most of the time, um, which seems probable considering that the pups are often left in shallow water while the parents are foraging, then that would be an option for them in the winter time as well. Uh, another consideration is that marine mammals haul out onto land more often during storm cycles. So if there is a winter storm cycle happening, it could be that otters and seals are coming onto land more often and would thus be available for wolves more frequently in the winter time versus the summertime. But again, we don't have any winter data, so we can only speculate for now about these things. If I had to make a prediction, I would think that marine mammals, especially with the absence of salmon, become an even more important source of um, food for wolves in the winter and in the spring when you know you have big storm cycles that are causing things like even walrus carcasses to wash up in some places of southwest Alaska, which is a, a ton of meat for free showing up on the beach. Are there any questions online? Any other questions here? Anybody? All right, thank you so much, Ellen, for presenting. We really appreciate you coming in virtually. Yeah, thank you so much again for the opportunity and thanks to everyone who's there in person. You're awesome. Yeah, and this talk will be recorded and um, I'll share you the link and if you guys wanna go back and look at anything, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Great. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Steve, you want to volunteer for the follow-up?